Hello, Taruna. Hi, um, we're almost ready to begin. Okay, that's perfect. Hello. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for rejoining us for the afternoon session of the Global South Symposium on Soji and ESCR. This afternoon's session will be on economic, social, and cultural rights, and I will hand over to um, Tim Hodgson from the ICJ to give a brief introduction um, and to introduce our keynote speaker. But before I hand over, I would just like to emphasize some of our housekeeping rules if you're only joining us now. So we'd kindly request that you name yourself accordingly on Zoom and you are also welcome to include your pronouns. This event will be recorded and it is currently being live streamed to YouTube. And we will have a question and answer session towards the end of the panel discussion, but if you have any comments, questions, you are welcome to please share them in the chat room. And if you find yourself accidentally exiting this webinar, please just use the same link again to rejoin. I will share the live stream link shortly if you would like to alternatively join us via the YouTube platform instead. And um, just once again, interpretation is available. So you are able to access this webinar in French by accessing the interpretation control function on Zoom. Um, and we would like to request for our speakers to please speak a little slowly to accommodate our interpreters and to allow them to do the interpretation to the best of their ability. But now I will hand over to Tim, thank you. Thanks, Zeruna. Um, could I just check before I go ahead on into this? Professor Chiro, I see you here, but are you at your computer? Um, could we just check that you're here and uh, capable of hearing us before we introduce you and say my opening remarks? Yes. I okay, thank you very much. Okay, so my name is Tim Hodgson. I am from the International Commission of Jurists. Uh, I'm based in Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, and I lead our work globally on economic and social rights. Um, thank you for coming to attend or watching uh, wherever you're watching on YouTube or after the fact. Um, as you can see, we've got uh, quite a packed lineup over the next two days, and we're covering a lot of ground with the ultimate aim of doing a workshop, um, which is or a colloquium, which is ultimately intersecting various issues. So very big issues of, of, of discrimination and marginalization of particularly sec on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity in Africa, as well as the protection of economic and social rights in Africa. And hopefully by the end of the workshop, we'll have uh, both uh, some clear indication of the very clear intersections between poverty and inequality and discrimination against sexual orientation or persons on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, and, and to chart a way forward for the advocacy that all of us here, including the Center for Human Rights and the International Commission of Jurists does. Um, so we uh, initially conceptualized uh, these uh, webinars as separate, but when we started talking about it, we realized that the overlaps between them were so significant and so important that we really should mix them up and put them together. And the way that this program is designed <clears throat> is that we can speak about a number of topics, um, bringing on the expertise of experts from both areas, and then hopefully drawing them together to try and chart a way forward um, on advocacy and to acknowledge and recognize the developments that they've been in the African continent, which has actually been a leader in many respects in the proliferation of human rights standards in relation to both economic and social rights and sexual orientation and gender identity. So to begin with now, I won't take up any more of your time. I will just introduce uh, the keynote speaker for our first uh, panel. Um, the keynote speaker is Professor Danwood Chirwa from the University of Cape Town. Professor Chirwa is the Dean of Law at the University of Cape Town and has played a role in the curriculum development and administration of human rights of postgraduate programs. He is rated by the NRF as an internationally acclaimed researcher and his research is largely focused on normative frameworks and institutional mechanisms for the protection of the rights of vulnerable groups, such as poor, the poor and children, as well as models of domestic implementation of certain specific rights. He 
uh, also promoted Africa-focused legal research and worked with leading and emerging academics on the continent. Professor Chirwa has worked closely with a wide range of civil society and international organizations in South Africa, Africa, and beyond, and is a board member of various organizations. I'd like to just add two things, um, if Professor Chirwa would allow me. Uh, although I am a UCT alumni myself, I unfortunately missed out on being taught by Professor Chirwa, so I think I'm going to take this uh, webinar as an experience of uh, supplementing my legal education personally. And the second thing is that I that I would encourage you all to look online for an excellent book that is co-edited by Professor Chirwa and Professor Lillian can we um, on economic, social and cultural rights in Africa? Um, I would look out for this. It's a very, very good resource and we've used it a lot in International Commission of Jurists work. Without further ado though then, um, I will let Professor Chewa move into his presentation. Thank you very much, Timothy, for your kind introduction. Um, I'm, I'm Dan Chira, um, as uh, has been introduced and I'm Dean at UCT. Um, I will start with an apology that um, I've reworked the title of the presentation that I'm making, um, um, partly because of my role now, which doesn't allow me enough time to think about research, um, prepare in advance, uh, and all of that. So, so the talk that I'm, 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 I'm doing now is based on a paper that I wrote with my postdoc fellow last year. Um, it's not uh, about the role of international mechanisms, but the role of regional mechanisms uh, on the protection of human rights. Uh, Tanvia was kind enough to allow me to, to, to speak on this rather than the actual topic that was given to me. Um, and, and so my apologies for that, uh, but I hope it is still um, relevant. Um, it, it is also the case that I'm not up to date uh, with regards to all the regional systems uh, that I'll be talking about, but in general broad outline, um, um, I would be happy to speak about what we wrote in that paper. Um, with those remarks, uh, uh, let me also point out that I, I would have loved to attend the whole of this event uh, because this is the exciting part uh, of academic life. Um, when you have a group of uh, people, researchers, uh, civil society, uh, activists, um, and academics um, coming together to think about issues, especially in human rights, um, and more especially the topic of um, close to my heart, which is about economic, social, and cultural rights. I'm not sure how long uh, I have. I suppose maybe 20 minutes or so. Um, could I just have an indication as to how many minutes I speak? Um, I believe according to our uh, schedule, you have about 30 minutes. So uh, we, about? Have, I think one of the first, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. So, 30, okay, uh, all right. Yes, and, and our uh, facilitators will uh, flag you down and wave at you if you are moving or encroaching on that time. All right, so, so perfect then. Um, so in this uh, presentation then, I'll be speaking about the role of regional mechanisms for the protection of economic, social and cultural rights. Um, I'll look at uh, all the three uh, regional mechanisms um, as it were, the American one, the inter-American one, the African one, and the uh, European one. Of course, um, 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 the point to, to make is that uh, regional mechanisms have strengthened and reached, enriched the protection of uh, economic, social, and cultural rights um, 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 at the regional levels it, uh, at which they operate, but also at the international level and domestic level as well. Um, uh, this stands in contrast to the assumption that was made um, uh, early on within the UN um, that uh, regional systems could institutionalize relativity and hence the dilution of human rights. Um, so the, the paper that we wrote makes the argument that far from watering down the protection of economic, social and cultural rights, in fact, regional specificities uh, have accentuated certain aspects of economic, social and cultural rights, complemented and bolstered uh, the UN system uh, and domestic system for the protection of these rights. 
In fact, region systems have over the years also learned from each other and have come closer rather than apart as uh, was um, contrary to what was uh, feared. Now, um, regional systems for the protection of human rights in general are taken for granted now, but this wasn't always the case. Uh, there was opposition uh, to them before and after the formation of the UN. Um, and you might not be surprised uh, to learn that regional systems are not mentioned in the UN Charter itself. Uh, this position within the UN changed only after 1966, um, following the delays in the adoption of the Covenant on, on Civil and Political Rights, and of course the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which led to regional groups, especially the European and the South American uh, ones, to adopt um, the, uh, regional instruments. Um, at the center of the opposition to regional systems was the argument about universality, uh, which I've mentioned that regional systems could mean different standards of human rights and detract from their universality. Uh, Ines Claude uh, was very dismissive of regional approaches, regionalist uh, approaches to human rights um, um, uh, citing at, at least three main problems with them, uh, that um, there are no neat regional boundaries. Uh, the universal system uh, which the UN has avoids uh, tackling the issue of where do we draw the regional boundaries. Um, he also said human rights are a problem of international character that requires solutions at the global level, a point which I very much like. Um, he also said the effectiveness of regional systems could be impaired by local rivalry, uh, rivalries, uh, which could also impede impartiality, impartiality of dispute resolution mechanisms uh, that these um, regional systems would set up. Um, Karel Vasak was uh, more supportive or more open to regional human rights systems but he too um, uh, set the bar too high for the success of such systems. He argued, for instance, that um, the regional protection of human rights can achieve full success only if it contains an element um, in a policy of integration on the part of states uh, of a given region. So there has to be some level of, uh, of integration among states in order for human rights to to, uh, to succeed at the regional level. Um, of course, this point suggests that the greater that states are integrated within a region, the more effective a human rights system can be. Um, um, something that uh, we see uh, when people make the connection between the regional economic uh, communities and human rights that uh, perhaps that uh, there's a link there. Um, but um, if one applies this to the UN system of human rights, um, then the argument breaks down, of course, because uh, the UN system of human rights doesn't depend on regional integration at all. Um, I guess in appreciating the role of regional human rights systems, um, one has to consider the fact that human rights evolve and are, are experienced in diverse ways in space and time. Um, so far from assuming that the interaction between the global or regional or local will be adversarial, um, one could assume uh, that uh, regional conceptualizations of rights could serve as a bridge between the universal and the local uh, and therefore reinforce um, the international human rights system as it were. Um, so the argument for regional systems in fact builds on the possibility of comp complementarity and mutual dependence with the universal system and of course uh, the domestic systems themselves. Um, so you don't start from the point of um, uh, um, um, an ad adversarial um, uh, coexistence, but one of complementarity. Uh, and of course, regional systems have advantages such as um, uh, the likelihood of building consensus faster. Um, we saw how the African Charter on the Rights and Duties of the Child uh, 
or the African child was uh, adopted within one year, uh, um, 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 very soon after the IC, the, the covenant on, on on the rights of sorry the convention on the rights of the child. Um, one could also see the shared cultural and historical experiences and values um, as human rights uh, scholars and uh, activists. Uh, we tend to be very afraid of um, culture and history, um, but um, these uh, can also have a positive positive impact on the normative development and enforcement uh, of human rights. Um, and our paper does show that, that actually uh, the cultural and historical specificities of the regions have bolstered uh, the protection of economic, social and cultural rights and other rights, um, 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 partly um, also because they provide a basis for the legitimacy of human rights. Um, if human rights are not grounded in the histories and, and, and philosophies of the regions, um, they tend to lose that legitimacy. For instance, people saying human rights are a Western concept, when in fact uh, they are um, um, uh, histories that show that uh, some rights were recognized in Africa, for instance, um, in one way or another. Um, so, so um, there are some advantages that regional systems um, uh, bring, um, um, which I've highlighted, including um, um, trying to found or ground rights within specific uh, cultural and historical experiences and values, um, um, which improves the legitimacy of these rights. Um, now, in terms of the role that uh, regional systems have pl played, one can look at it from the normative uh, perspective, but also enforcement. I will speak perhaps a little bit more on the normative role that uh, regional systems have played um, um, because the enforcement bit is more or less um, uh, quite uh, tried, it's, it's more obvious. And, and here one uh, can start looking at the founding instruments as a basis uh, of looking at this. And um, initially, at least, one can say that there was a um, divergence in approaches. Uh, the regional systems adopted what appeared to be quite different uh, approaches to the protection of economic, social, and cultural rights in, in particular. Um, and, and But over time, um, they have more or less moved closer together. Um, and one can see this um, um, when uh, evidence is considered. So there can be no doubt that regional circumstances have played a role, a significant role, in the development of human rights in general and economic, social, and cultural rights in particular. Um, the, uh, far from undermining the international protection of uh, human rights, the diversity with which uh, these rights uh, have been protected at the regional level um, have um, um, overall strength, strengthened um, and enhanced the protection of uh, these rights. Um, so in the founding instruments, uh, one will see that the European system with its European convention focused more on civil and political rights, partly because of its history, which um, uh, um, uh, is from um, um, emphasized more of democracy and civil liberties. Um, and although the European social, social charter was adopted in 1961, um, um, it did not have a complaints mechanism until 1995, when the coll collective complaint procedure was introduced. Um, so within Europe, the emphasis was um, initially on civil and political rights, uh, at least if one considers human rights as justiciable uh, rights. The Inter-American system uh, with its um, American convention also uh, placed much emphasis on civil and political rights. Um, and again, this system was reacting to a history of dictatorships um, and enforced disappearances that were happening in that region. 
Um, but there was a slight difference in this system uh, compared to the European one um, in that there was some general reference to economic, social, and cultural rights um, in Article 26. Um, um, the additional protocol was adopted much later with an extensive protection of these rights, um, but only the right to organize and the right to education were subject to the petition procedure. So the, the exclusion of economic, social, and cultural rights or the inferior treatment of these rights in the two systems was obvious. Um, um, of course, this position changed a bit um, for the good, for the better in the inter-American system when the adv adv advisory opinion on the legal effect of the American Declaration on Human Rights was uh, issued in 1989, practically saying that the declaration had binding effects on parties to the uh, OAS uh, Charter. The African Commission, of course, had some limited number of economic, social, and cultural rights. Sorry, the African Charter uh, had some uh, economic, social, and cultural rights in it, but the real innovation were third generation rights, the right to development, um, the right to self determination, the right to a healthy environment, um, and other third generation rights there, um, which meant that although there were less economic, so typical economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, the totality of the treaty was such that it gave um, almost full effect to the interdependence of um, um, human rights. So the systems start from uh, far apart, um, but uh, over time, um, uh, they come much more together. Um, and, and um, we see this through the development of three specific mechanisms, uh, which I would call models of protecting economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, with the African adopting initially the direct model um, of protecting economic, social, and cultural rights, the European system um, more, and the uh, inter-American system more of the indirect model at the beginning um, 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 and and um, or no economic, social, and cultural rights, but later on uh, through interpretation, the inter indirect model taking shape. Um, but over time, the hybrid model, which includes both direct and indirect, has evolved, uh, and and this uh, includes both the African system and the inter-American uh, system, um, which have done so, and and this is mostly. Um, because of the ways in which um, the uh, monitoring bodies in these regions have interpreted uh, civil political rights um, and other rights more innovatively to include protection of economic, uh, social, and cultural rights. And, and, and the main examples here, uh, uh, the examples here come from across these uh, regions. Um, maybe the European Court on Human Rights, uh, on, on human, and, uh, human rights has uh, pioneered the indirect approach more um, because uh, it has used um, some civil political rights um, to read in, um, quite a, a number of economic, what we would call economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, um, but the African one in particular um, is interesting to the extent that the way it uses its indirect model um, is, is um, it, it draws on a wider range of rights because it already has uh, some economic, social, and cultural rights. It already has uh, um, uh, many, third generation rights, and then civil and political rights. So it draws on all of these rights in order to cure the gaps that are um, in that uh, treaty. Now, these um, approaches um, in the African context, especially, um, have seen the, um, uh, and the fact that they have been, the, 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 this has happened, has seen more and more constitutions especially after 2010, I would say, um, um, join uh, the direct protection model. Uh, you know, South Africa was the first 
um, um, to extensively protect economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, but the number of states that are um, protecting economic, social, and cultural rights using the direct model has grown. Uh, on my count, we are more than 20 uh, now um, of African countries. Um, the most recent examples, of course, Kenya um, and Zimbabwe, very extensive protections of, of economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, the one uh, protection model I found quite interesting is the hybrid one where the um, uh, only some rights are protected as economic, social, and cultural rights, and these tend to be uh, quite a few. Um, and then um, um, you still have the civil and political rights, of course, and uh, princip uh, principles of uh, policy, uh, state policy, um, which tend to be quite extensive. Um, and and these the, the countries that have this approach, uh, Malawi, uh, Uganda, especially Ethiopia, Ghana, Namibia, uh, Eritrea as well, um, uh, uh, it, 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 it's not expanding. It, 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 there are no more countries that are joining this model, but I find it uh, quite interesting to the extent that it looks more like um, um, the way the African Charter itself was designed with very few economic, social, and cultural rights, and then um, uh, third generation rights, more of, of third generation rights, and of course the civil and political rights. And together, these rights have been interpreted to uh, include more economic, social, and cultural rights. The, the, at the domestic level, the jurisprudence is not coming out um, as much as possible from the hybrid models, um, uh, as may, maybe South Africa has done, um, but there are elements there that show that this model is capable of expanding uh, quite a lot. Um, and it's interesting that these countries, almost most of them in the hybrid model, uh, at least included third generation rights in their constitution, for instance, Malawi, the right to development, which is quite extensive. I think in, in, in Uganda, it is the right to environment. Um, and, and, and one looks forward to when these provisions will be adjudicated and uh, used much more in order to protect uh, vulnerable groups. Um, um, the, um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish in five minutes, uh, so I'll, I'll quickly wrap up. The other area which I wanted to talk about, especially in terms of showing how regional systems have learned from, learned from each other, but also bolstered each other, um, 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 and the international system, it's the way the African Charter was drafted, um, which did not include the general limit, internal limitations that are built into economic, social, and cultural rights such as uh, within available resources, um, uh, concepts such as progressive realization were not there. It was originally thought that this meant that uh, the African Charter would have to be interpreted differently. Um, for instance, when cases came before the commission, it was argued by the likes of Odinkalo and others that the, the approach to be adopted would be the violations ap approach. approach rather than come up with certain predetermined standards, you look at the facts, the totality of the facts, and say whether there's a violation or not. Um, of course, if one looks at the uh, some cases from the African Commission or communications, there is an element of the violations approach there. But now you can see that um, much of the jurisprudence that has been developed elsewhere about economic, social, and cultural rights has been uh, taken on board, uh, suggesting that the African Charter um, uh, doesn't have to be interpreted uh, too differently um, from other um, uh, treaties that have been developed. And it specifically, it has used, the African Commission has used the due diligence test uh, developed by the case of uh, Velasquez um, um, Honduras, uh, Rodriguez Velasquez Honduras. Um, the reason is a standard uh, 
um, in a confused way uh, from um, it has adopted from South Africa in some confused way and also from the, the, the UN general comments, especially the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. But also uh, I see the Honduras case also in that um, the African Commission has also used the notion of the resources um, and concepts around how uh, that those have to play a role in decisions about um, um, about enforcement of economic, social, and cultural rights. But perhaps the area where regional systems have really played a big role is by coming up with binding mechanisms of enforcing economic, social, and cultural rights. So all the three regions have courts which can issue binding um, decisions. Um, of course, um, um, the way the courts uh, work in the three regions is very complex and different, um, but this is um, a, a strength that is not shared by the uh, UN system so far. So in conclusion, um, I'm sorry I've gone through this very quickly. Um, it, it can be said uh, without um, uh, a hesitancy that regional systems have not undermined the universality of human rights. Uh, quite on the contrary, um, they have uh, enriched uh, these uh, rights. Um, there have been different emphasis and approaches uh, which have uh, um, drawn on regional specificities, um, but over time there is more of a convergence, learning from each other and uh, bolstering of the protection of these rights. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof Chirwa. I think that was such an insightful discussion. Um, given that we have a few minutes left um, for your keynote address session, um, I would like to invite um, the people in the audience to please pose any questions or comments um, regarding this address. And if there's anything you'd like to specifically touch on, you are welcome to do so. So you can either raise your hand or unmute and speak. I see that we have um, Annette Katutu, you've unmuted. Okay, um, I think that might have been an accident. Um, we have a hand from Timothy, you can go ahead. Hi, thanks Taruna and thank you Professor Chua. Uh, for the presentation. Um, I think I'd just like to ask you to speak about where you where you left off um, a little bit more. <clears throat> the African court has not, has, has sort of dipped its toe into economic and social rights in a recent advisory opinion and in one judgment maybe, but it hasn't had a case to answer about economic and social rights directly. Um, is there anything that you can tell us about uh, your hopes for how the African court might approach economic and social rights, and uh, some there's some maybe obvious problems with why it hasn't uh, that you can maybe touch on. Should I answer now? Uh, it doesn't look like there's anyone else, so maybe okay. go for it now and we'll see All right. someone else. So, so that's a disappointing bit. Um, that we have uh, the court, uh, and yet it's not uh, been asked to adjudicate on economic, social, and cultural rights uh, up to now. Of course, uh, the African Commission itself took almost 15 years um, um, before, if not longer, before it issued a decision on economic, social, and cultural rights, um, um, more or less. Um, um, the main decision that it has to date. Um, so one hopes it will change, but I'm not surprised. Um, even domestically, um, apart from South Africa and increasingly Kenya um, and Uganda, um, we have many good constitutions with economic, social, and cultural rights domestically, which are not being uh, taken to court. Um, I come from Malawi, and Malawi also has a very good constitution, as I said, the right to development. And there have been many prime um, examples where a case could have been uh, taken to court. Um, 
but they haven't. Partly because it's much more difficult to litigate economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, you really need to have strong organizations um, that can prepare uh, the evidence, uh, expert witnesses, um, and bring a case. Um, it's much easier to argue civil and political rights cases, um, and even to get funding perhaps. Um, um, but uh, economic, social, and cultural rights cases require much more skills and um, planning and coordination. So, so, so in terms of expectations, I'd, I'd like to think that the court has a lot uh, within its arsenal. What we don't know is the approach it will take, whether it will uh, uh, go on to embrace what the commission has been doing. Um, and, 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 and then uh, we'll see what, how the orders that the court would um, um, uh, make would impact on state compliance. I see there's another hand. Maria. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I was just about to say Maria can go next. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for this very, very interesting and insightful keynote. And I'm very much looking forward to read your paper. Um, so maybe this question is answered in the paper, but um, I would, I would still be curious because you actually mentioned learning processes um, and I was wondering to what extent you looked at or you can address um, how these regional organizations with these specific uh, mechanisms maybe learn from one another or there was any kind of diffusion happening between them in, in any um, direction possible. Um, thank you so much. So, so, so the learning takes place um, in different uh, ways, but um, uh, there are two obvious ones. The one is uh, the drafting of the treaties. I can give the most recent example, the, um, the African protocol, the protocol to the African Charter on the rights of other persons. Um, which was adopted more or less um, uh, simultaneously with the, um, the Inter-American um, um, Convention. I can't tell which, how it is, but it could be also a protocol uh, or a separate one on, on other persons. Um, if you study those two, you can see that um, they were working from similar um, uh, drafts uh, and were learning from, from each other. Of course, I've seen, I've participated at some conferences where you had people from um, both these uh, organizations. Um, the other is through the cases. Um, so it is clear that in the Sera case, the African Commission read the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Commission. Um, but that really depends on the lawyers who appear before these um, regional um, organizations. Um, Increasingly also the, um, um, the political organs of these organizations uh, speak to one another a lot, uh, to speak to each other a lot. And you can see similarities in the kinds of things that they're doing. Uh, of course, some differences as well. Thank you so much, Prof. Chirwa. Um, we have our last question, which was posted in the chat from, I apologize for the way I'm going to pronounce her name. Rocio Quintero, um, and they ask, can you elaborate a little more on the info, info regarding the use of the judgment of Velasquez Rodriguez? It would be useful if Prof. Chera can share the link of the paper he analyzes the different regional systems. All right, so let me see, am I might be okay. Um, that case um, dealt with a situation of disappearances in South America, in Honduras. Uh, people could be disappeared by the military regime there, uh, and they could not be found. And so families were looking for them, uh, reported to police. Um, the police did shambolic investigations, and, and then the, um, they went to the commission and, and there it was, I think it, to the commission and to the court itself, I think it's a court decision. Um, 
the the decision was that um, so so this is a case where you cannot prove that it is a, a state that has disappeared uh, these um, people um, but so the, this court was the first as far as I can remember uh, that said that applied the notion of due diligence which has become very popular now. Um, it practically, it said that Honduras was responsible for failing to investigate the disappearances um, and the standard by which it was found responsible was to say um, um, it, it did not take reasonable measures to uh, prevent the uh, disappearances, but also to investigate and provide access to remedies. It's a 1986 case, I think. And, and so in the African Commission, how it was applied uh, was that the, uh, you remember in the Sera case, uh, the case was about the environmental pollution, pollution um, that happened in the Ogon land and people got uh, sick uh, from um, bad water, um, but also um, um, other forms of uh, pollution. Um, uh, resulting in many complexities, but also when they engaged in protests, people were killed, uh, shelter was um, um, was damaged, and food sources were also damaged. So the African Commission uh, found that Nigeria was responsible uh, for its own role, uh, deploying the uh, military personnel uh, to quell the protests, but also that it had failed to exercise due diligence to prevent uh, pollution, um, which was taking place because of the oil companies. So, so in a sense, uh, applying exactly the standard developed by the uh, um, Rodriguez case, Honduras, uh, the Rodriguez Honduras case. Um, um, so, it's the second time, as far as I can, I, I know, where the there was um, uh, this indirect horizontality that was applied. Uh, by the African Commission and then the uh, the Inter-American Court. Right. Unfortunately, I don't have the uh, the paper is not yet published yet, so um, um, I, I would have to seek permission from the editor. All right. Um, sorry to interrupt you. Um, and thank you very much for your time today, Prof. Chewa. I think that um, the audience will agree with me that this was um, a very interesting start to the ESCR sessions. And I think that building on some of your insights, we will further explore the use of regional mechanisms um, for promoting ESCR in Africa. Um, so we will now move to our next session, which is a panel discussion. And this panel discussion is on the legal culture and the judicial enforcement of economic, social, and cultural rights. And what is the role of international human rights law and transformative constitutionalism? So this panel will be moderated by Timothy Fish from the ICJ. And I will allow Timothy to introduce um, the panelists for this session. Thank you. Okay, so I will introduce the panelists for the session um, as they uh, need to speak to save some time because we had some good questions there. But I see that uh, Dr. Murkart is here, that Michael is here, and so is Professor Paul Yun. Um, who will be our panelists in short. Um, I will read out their bios before uh, they speak. Um, <clears throat> but uh, for the panelists, you've got sort of eight to 10 minutes with the time that we've allocated so that we can still have a, a nice discussion afterwards and a Q&A session. Um, so somebody shout at me if there's a problem. Uh, really, the idea is for this to follow on what Professor Chirwa has said and look at some topics that are extremely, um, extremely relevant across Africa in the adjudication of economic and social rights. And we're also going to test the intersections of economic and social rights with various issues, including environmental rights. But to begin with, we've got Professor Fu Yun. And uh, Professor Fu Yun is, as we said earlier, at the University of Pretoria. He is a professor of human rights law and the director of the Center of Human Rights, the Faculty of Law at the University of Pretoria. 
He has recently been appointed to the UN Human Rights Council Advisory Committee. Congratulations, Professor Fuyun. Um, his area of interest is international human rights law with a focus on African regional human rights systems. Professor Fuyun has been involved in advocacy and training on the African regional human rights system and has been published very widely on international human rights law, of which I'm sure that everybody here is aware. He is an academic coordinator of the master's program in human rights and democratization in Africa, presented by the center itself in collaboration with partner law faculties across the continent. Professor Fuyun is acknowledged internationally as a recognized researcher. He has won awards for exceptional achiever at the University of Pretoria and is the editor of the African Human Rights Law Reports and the African Human Rights Journal. He has vast experience in court organizing moot court competitions, which are very popular, and has been involved in the African Human Rights Moot Court Competition since 1992. Professor Fuyun, uh, after that, uh, your, the time is yours. You have sort of eight to 10 minutes and I'll start waving at you furiously so that we can move on. Okay, thank you very much um, for that introduction. Um, yes, let me let me thank the organizers for the opportunity. Uh, it's wonderful. You know, I could say that uh, we've listened to uh, Professor uh, Danwood Chiwa and we, we can rest our case. But let me um, start by the word I saw also in the, in the panel um, title, that is the kind of idea of legal culture. I, I use legal culture here, like Carl Clare in that seminal article, the idea that, you know, in, in, in legal circles between lawyers, those who practice law, those maybe who are close to the law, um, there are certain sensibilities, let's call them knee-jerk reactions. There are certain understandings that, uh, that we are packaged around. And I, I'm, I'm looking at how those cultural understandings, the legal culture, um, sometimes is an impediment really to realizing uh, socioeconomic rights or the justiciability specifically of, of socioeconomic rights. I want to link back to one uh, point that Professor Chirwa made, and that is the rationale, the reason, the advantage for regional systems. And one that I would add is the accessibility. So I think in terms of the idea of legitimacy, he mentioned that as well, the uh, physical proximity of a court in Arusha, uh, commission in Banjul, as opposed to perhaps, uh, you know, Geneva or New York. Clearly that I think resonates with our, uh, with our uh, sensibilities, our, senses, our sense of where, where we belong. It's as much, I think, um, a physical as a psychological sense of um, access. And I think that is important because I think uh, the regional system then in theory at least should be a more accessible system. The caveat to that is, at least we've seen the UN with the Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, taking sessions actually in a, in a particular country. So there's a move in the UN. And, and my late uh, colleague, Professor Christoph Haynes, was, was, was together with me also you know, making that case that the UN system should also become localized so, so that that kind of sense of legitimacy is increased. Perhaps it is, a, it is a, something that even in the regional system doesn't speak for itself. The regional system still has to also make more of that uh, accessibility, that proximity. The commission, I think, for many years now had not really met in other places on the continent. The court, I think, can use its competence to actually rotate uh, and be closer where it decides a particular case uh, in, and in that way resonate more with people and breach this kind of um, alienating uh, effect that uh, regional institutions may have and view that they may uh, engender in people. So just a small footnote, I think regional systems in principle are more accessible psychologically, physically, but uh, that needs to be reinforced and enhanced to also ensure that socioeconomic rights are realized at, at this level. The second point I wanted to make is just in terms of the inter-American system, I think there's actually an interesting example of uh, how uh, legal culture also constrains, in particular, the evolution of socioeconomic rights adjudication. Professor Chirwa mentioned Article 26. So in the American Convention, part of the, the rights that are you know, adjudicatable, <laughs> if that's the word, justiciable, there is Article 26 progressive a development. So it's a very convoluted article, but inside it, it seems there is a protection of socioeconomic rights, particular socioeconomic um, entitlements are mentioned. However, the Inter-American Court had for, for many, many years not accepted arguments that Article 26 is in fact justiciable. And in my view, 
that was also the cross-cultural effect. The Inter-American court judges often seeped into a European, and maybe it's controversial what I say now, European kind of understandings of, of human rights, educated in European institutions. They had a sense of deference to that kind of clear dichotomy that we saw in the European system of civil and political rights on this side, justiciable, and then socioeconomic rights, which is in the social charter and, and, and operate at a different level. I think from the very start, Article 26 was a vehicle to ensure the justiciability of socioeconomic rights, despite the fact that we have the 1988 San Salvador Protocol. And I suppose eventually, a few years back, uh, this has been accepted. And it's been accepted, I think, because there were some individuals in the court that, that fought very hard for this position to be taken. But I think this evolution, this very strong, this very elongated evolution speaks to this, this deep-seated culture conservative view often inspired by their particular legal education among lawyers, practitioners, and, and judges. I want to um, say something about uh, then the way in which, you know, the uh, decision of the regional institutions can be transformative, socioeconomic rights cases like Ogoni land um, and the mental health case in the Gambia. But to get to that point where we can um, get a judgment or a decision from the um, regional system, I think there are a number of hurdles which also relate to legal culture that need to be um, overcome. The first is uh, the accessibility, back to my first point. There needs to be a lawyer who actually has the wherewithal, the knowledge, the education, the insight that the regional system is useful and is a potential port of call. And I think we live in, a, in legal cultures where the African system is not given sufficient attention in even the legal education, not to speak about you know, education, generally speaking, that, that certainly is true. But even among our lawyers, our law students, there's a long way to go for legal culture will be changed through the education and not only the legal system, the regional system, but also the prospect of socioeconomic rights being realized through that system need to be much uh, more advanced. That links also to the question you posed, uh, Timothy, around the court and access to the court. I think um, linking to the, to the answer Professor Chiwa gave, I think another reason is that there just is not a cohort of um, well-organized uh, CSOs, NGOs that work on social economic rights in Africa. We find that by far the majority of NGOs work on civil and political rights. Now, the common wisdom is that that's the case because civil and political rights are more immediate. It's more immediate that someone should be, um, you know, torture should be prevented or uh, maybe cruel, inhuman, degrading punishment. That, that, that has a ring to it, but I think it's a false dichotomy. It is just as important, and we see that increasingly in the, in the world and the way that human rights um, are being questioned, that socioeconomic rights should be given priority. So uh, another part of the legal culture that is impeding access to the regional systems and uh, realization of socioeconomic rights specifically is uh, the, the lack of civil society organizations that uh, focus on um, socioeconomic rights. Um, I think in terms of implementation of the decisions of the um, uh, regional system, I think there we also uh, see that legal culture is impeding because in order for decisions, and as much as these decisions have been mentioned, the domestic application and implementation has been quite uh, limited. How can this be uh, addressed? Again, it is by having lawyers who from the very outset have that sense that uh, the remedial aspect of the case needs to uh, be given as much attention as the merits part. So that once one has a remedy in place, and it's a remedy that does go beyond the individual to structural and systemic issues, that that remedy is um, ready to be implemented and that the uh, lawyers work with civil society organizations together to ensure that that is the case. And again, legal culture often impedes these kind of collaborative um, approaches. My, my last point perhaps is that despite the importance of the regional system, that primacy of human rights realization, including socioeconomic rights, should be at the national level, the kind of idea of complementarity. Clearly, um, the idea of justiciable rights at the domestic level should be the first port of call. And that is important also because if that 
is not the case. If the, the, the justiciability of socioeconomic rights lacks at the domestic level, and um, there would be an access to the regional system from the local without the filtering process of having the issue being considered through domestic courts, I think that can pose legitimacy concerns. Because as we know, there is a requirement of the exhaustion of local remedies. So let's say you have a, a case about the right to uh, education, right to housing, right to uh, health. If that right is not justiciable at the domestic level, in principle, you should be exempted in terms of the jurisprudence of the African Commission Court from exploring or exhausting that remedy if it does not exist. It means that you'll take your problem, not raise it at the domestic level, and then take it to the international body or the regional body. And that obviously can give and fill a gap can give a remedy, but it would also uh, create a situation where important policy issues pertaining to socioeconomic rights are in the first instance decided at the supranational level, at the level of the Commission Court or at the UN level for that matter. And that clearly is not the ideal. So among many other reasons, that's another reason why we need to see justiciable uh, socioeconomic rights at the domestic level um, as a first port of call so that um, there could be, when this fails, that there could be an approach to uh, the supranational level for recourse um, through the court commission or uh, maybe in the UN system. So I try to keep to my uh, few minutes. Those are, were just a few footnotes and remarks, I think, to Dan Wood's wonderful presentation. And uh, I leave it at that and I invite questions and further discussion. Thank you, Timothy. Don't worry, Professor Fuyun, we will definitely bother you further. I think that uh, that what Professor Fuyun has put very well is what Sandra Fredman, Professor Sandra Fredman describes as economic and social rights being the Cinderella of the international human rights framework, still treated uh, as of secondary importance. And I think that there might be a question that we have to answer about uh, whether or not uh, even the encouragement of, of litigation in terms of the substandard and different uh, framework and different standards that we apply to economic and social rights has the effect of furthering this. But as Professor Fuyun highlights very well and as supplements uh, uh, Professor Chiro's presentation, uh, we are in a situation where there's very desperate need for further emphasis on regional experts in human rights law to do with economic and social rights and uh, attempting to litigate those rights. Um, but for now, we're going to move on uh, one of the panelists on the presentation, Professor Ebobra, um, has unfortunately not been able to attend and filling in at the last minute will be uh, Michael Nyako. And Michael um, is currently the manager of the Litigation and Implementation Unit at the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria, where he also serves as the editorial committee on the editorial committee of the African Human Rights Yearbook and edits the center's blog, Africa Law. His research interests include international human rights law broadly and African human rights systems in particular, socioeconomic rights, business and human rights, human rights and vulnerabilities, digital rights, and the impact or implementation of international human rights law and national legal systems. He is the author of several book chapters and journal papers on human rights and democratization in Africa and the co-editor of three books on governance and human rights in Africa. Michael also currently doubles up as a ESCR researcher for us at the, at the International Commission of Jurists, so he's a nice um, cross over for the collaboration that we have here um, and hopefully his uh, comments now will stimulate thought for everyone. Michael? Yes, uh, thank you very much Tim and uh, thank you to everyone who is participating with us today. So as you rightly mentioned, um, I'm sort of shadowing Prof. Ebobra and the presentation that he was supposed to give this afternoon, uh, which he couldn't because of some unfortunate events. So I'm basically presenting some ideas from him, which I have put together from a book chapter coming from that uh, wonderful book that you mentioned earlier about uh, the one that was edited by Prof. Dan Muchewa and uh, Prof. Uh, Lillian Chengwe. And I think for, for, for many people, we find the idea of regional, uh, sub-regional human rights courts and the uh, role in the uh, implementation or enforcement of economic, social, and cultural rights, or human rights generally, quite intriguing because these courts are not traditionally established as human rights courts per se. The primary motivation for establishing the sub-regional economic community courts is really about regional economic integration. And so one sometimes find it a bit intriguing that even though they have 
a very peculiar mandate that is related to integrating economies in different regions, they have over time become also quite involved in the adjudication of, of human rights and the economic, social and cultural rights as, as we would come to see uh, shortly. So it's, it's within that context that um, I make this uh, quick remarks and in the role that um, sub-regional human rights courts can put in or do play in, in the implementation of, of um, economic, social and cultural rights. But before we talk about the courts per se, uh, in terms of the regional uh, economic communities and their arrangements per se, even though the focus really is about economic integration, when we look at the kind of roles that they play and the motivation that uh, influences the setting up of these kinds of regional economic groupings, we see that economic, social and cultural rights should play a key role in the kind of things that they do. Because in essence, what these economic groupings do is to encourage trade uh, and exchange of goods and services, but also people among the economic bloc with the ultimate aim of improving the accumulation of resources for the individual members of, of the block, but also for the prosperity of the block as a whole. And perhaps conceptually, the fundamental basis of economic, social, and cultural rights generally is the improvement of the standards of living of, uh, of individuals and peoples and, and communities. So that even for regional economic uh, communities whose primary motivation is really economic integration, economic, social, and cultural rights getting a center stage in, in the things that they do could potentially also enhance you know, the, 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 the reception of, of regional economic communities by the, the populace um, whom the, 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 the states or their representatives claim to represent. Because it is perhaps much easier for people who, whose rights to education and healthcare and uh, employment or labor rights are properly prote protected within their own domestic spheres to be receptive to the idea that they, we're going to have a much more integrated you know, region where people can freely move across from one country to the other and can you know, establish businesses or you know, establish uh, other forms of, of, of uh, trade or linkages um, between these, these countries. So it's perhaps in the interest of these kind of sub-regional economic communities that they ensure that whilst they talk about trade liberalization and, and uh, you know, the, how to engage in combining resources or ensuring that resources are able to be accumulated among the states for the enhancement of their economic development, that critically they, they take a, a much you know, serious look at how to use those resources to improve the lives of, 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 of the people. Of course, the socioeconomic rights especially when it comes to the fulfillment obligation, being the one that requires most of, you know, uh, or more, more commitment of resources, it's, it's, it stands reason to assume that if the ultimate aim of regional economic communities is to amass resources, then they should be applying, you know, these uh, resources to the pr promotion and the protection and the fulfillment of economic, social and cultural rights. But specifically when it comes to the African region and the, the various sub-regional groupings that you know have emerged uh, over over the, the past sixty years or so, we see that I mean, they, there are so many of them. Even though the African Union currently recognizes eight um, sub-regional economic communities, the ones that have over the years been quite involved or developed, you know, specific or sometimes not direct but indirect um, sort of jurisdiction over human rights and eco economic, social, and cultural rights in particular. Was community part of uh, was, um, economic community of West African states, which uh, is enforced by the Ecowas Community Court of Justice. We've seen the East African economy, East African community, and the East African Court of Justice, and then the Southern African Development Community, which previously used to have the SADC tribunal that had access, you know, for direct access for individuals um, and civil society to lay complaints involving human rights violations. Well, specifically, we see that apart from the ECOWAS court, which uh, has developed this idea of applying the African Charter as its base instrument, the East African court does not have a direct human rights um, jurisdiction per se. And even though they do involve themselves in human rights issues um, 
quite frequently, the, the access to that regional mechanism court is really through the implementation or enforcement of the East African Treaty. So that even though the court has over the years been involved in a number of human rights cases, and as I would speak about quite uh, in, in, in a few minutes, in a few economic, social, and uh, cultural rights cases, the real manner in which the cases are presented is not as though they are human rights violations, but as though they are violations of the East African Treaty itself. And then litigants can find within the treaty the, the values you know, such as dignity or the promote, uh, promotion and protection of rights and use that as the basis of claiming you know, violation of, of specific um, treaty um, obligations within the treaty itself. So unlike the ECOWAS court where one can go and complain about the violation of the African Charter, you could not do the same um, within the East African court. And it's, it's, it makes it a, little, a, a bit more you know, difficult to approach the court with specific economic, social, and cultural rights um, claims, even though one could be crafty about how to navigate around that you know, specific dilemma in couching it more as a East African treaty violation rather than specific human rights violations. Of course, the SADC tribunal is the unfortunate one that currently does not have any direct access for individuals or um, CSOs who might have claims against specific states for violations of human rights. But we do know that the Southern African development community has actually developed a number of treaties that do have uh, important provisions on economic, social, and cultural rights. There's a, a number of treaties that talk about the promotion and protection of resources for you know, combating HIV AIDS or other kinds of deadly diseases or to eradicate poverty. We know of the, 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 the SADC uh, protocol on gender, which makes important commitments on the economic, social, and cultural rights of, of, of women in, in the SADC region. So this was really a court that could make you know, very deliberate and very important uh, decisions that would impact the lived realities when it comes to economic, social, and cultural rights of people within the SADC region. But over the past 10 years, we know how the SADC tribunal has been you know, stripped of its individual complaints mandate. And perhaps this should also give us uh, a bit more you know, commitment to, in our individual ways, try to you know, lobby our governments in, in ways that they could raise to that uh, direct complaints mechanism before the, for individuals and CSOs before the SADC tribunal, because it does have a number of uh, quite um, comprehensive normative frameworks on economic, social, and cultural rights, which could benefit uh, from you know, interpretation and enforcement by the SADC tribunal if individuals and CSOs had access to the court and could you know, properly litigate um, before the, the SADC tribunal. But of course, when we, we look at what exactly it is that you know, these courts have actually done in terms of their jurisprudence over the, the course of the two decades or so, in which most of them have been functional in that respect, we see that perhaps the ECOWAS court has been the one that has been more visible in its protection of economic, social, and cultural rights. It have had pronouncements on the, the right to work, which I think it was in 2004, in the case of Asian versus the Republic of Gambia, is, is uh, reported to be one of the first cases in which an international human rights court actually did make pronouncement on what it means when a, when, when a provisionist talks about equal work for equal pay. And even though the court did not grant you know, the kind of remedies that the applicant in this case, who was uh, disputing you know, different difference in salary between himself as an employee at the time of the Commonwealth Secretariat. And he had been, re re the, 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 the University of the Gambia, which he had been sent to as a professor uh, on consultation from the Commonwealth Secretariat, had sought to reduce his salary uh, com to comparable salaries with, with, with local lecturers. And he tried to claim that that was discrimination. But he was not successful, but the court did make you know, important pronouncements on the, the scope and content of equal work for equal pay, and specifically saying that, that in some instances, providing different salaries for employees who work on the same you know, uh, scope of work might amount to discrimination. 
um, and a violation of the, the right to receive equal work or equal pay. But we've also seen the ECOWAS court, for instance, make very specific and far wide ranging pronouncements about the right to environment in Serap versus Nigeria, for instance, where the court was quite um, you know, stern in talking about from Serac and, 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 and Nigeria from the African Commission that state member states could actually be held liable for degradation, which is caused by third parties, where the state fails to either prevent the, the environmental degradation or to actively ensure that the third party, if, whether it's a non-state actor or it's, it's a state institution, remedy the kind of effects that comes out of that kind of environmental degradation. So the, the, the attribution of you know, the, the conduct of third parties to a state that is can we wrap not performing. Up, Michael, it's, sorry, it's, sorry. Can, can we, I'm not sure that you saw my warning, but we're going to need to wrap up, Michael, and then we'll come back to you. Yes, no, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just wrap up quickly there, Tim. And then when, when it comes to the, 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 the East African court, for instance, I mean, the, in, in this particular instance, uh, the welfare brought a case, which really was not about the right to environment per se, because you could not claim the right to environment in the East African court. So they, they sought protection for the um, protection of wildlife and, and, and other resources because the, the state of Tanzania wanted to construct a highway through an environmentally protected neighborhood, which the court agreed with the applicants. So uh, in essence, well, what I'm trying to say is that these kind of regional economic communities do have an important role to play in terms of both developing the normative framework, but also that the courts should perhaps be more and more encouraged and be, be uh, provided with the legitimate um, normative framework to be able to perform is quite important. And I hope that I'll have an opportunity to further elaborate on this in comments and questions. Thank you, Tim. Thanks very much, Michael. So what you can see from the two presentations so far is that when we're talking about legal cultures, there's many different types of legal cultures at many different levels, regional and sub-regional and domestic, that are really challenging by trying to um, litigate on economic and social rights. And actually where Michael left off is a good segue to our next presentation by which we are looking to be challenged on uh, issues relating to legal culture and environmental rights. But let me first introduce the next panelist, Dr. Melanie Murcott. Dr. Murcott is a senior lecturer at the Department of Public Law, Faculty of Law at the University of Pretoria, where she teaches administrative law and environmental law. She's also an attorney of the High Court of South Africa and a solicitor of England and Wales on the non-practicing role. Her research focuses on the potential of environmental law and administrative law to contribute to South Africa's project of transformative constitutionalism. And this is also the topic of her doctoral thesis. She developed and introduced postgrad programs in environmental law at the University of Pretoria, an LLM and an MPhil, as well as a short course on environmental law. She continually introduces innovations into her teaching on environmental law, both at a postgraduate level and an undergraduate level, including through a tour of abandoned mines and gold fields, film screenings, photo exhibitions, and collaborations with local and international scholars, as well as local and, and NGOs. She's an active member of the International Union on the Conservation of Nature Academy of Environmental Law, which has got a confusing acronym, a key researcher of the Africa Observatory of Humanities for the Environment, and an executive committee member of the Environmental Law Association of South Africa. Um, Dr. Burkott, welcome. And we are looking forward to your comments now uh, spurred on by the last two speakers. Great, thanks, Tim. It's wonderful to be here. I'm going to talk a little bit about how a legal theory of transformative environmental constitutionalism can influence legal culture and promote the enforcement of economic, social, and cultural rights. So transformative constitutionalism, as we all know, is about unlocking the transformative potential of South Africa's constitution, particularly its overarching social justice imperative to achieve dignity, equality and freedom for all people in South Africa, particularly to improve the lived realities of South Africa's poor, vulnerable and marginalized. Environmental constitutionalism is a growing phenomenon that involves constitutional protection of the environment in constitutional texts and by courts around the world. My theory of transformative environmental constitutionalism weaves these two ideas together on the basis that it is the environment that creates the conditions in which social justice and human flourishing can occur. 
It hopes to shift South African legal culture to be more responsive to the interconnected nature of social, environmental, and climate injustices. From the perspective of rights discourse, the theory highlights that a well-functioning environment is a precondition for the fulfillment of economic, social, and cultural rights. The theory then challenges the false dichotomy that those who seek to protect the environment are anti-development or anti-poor, rather that these things, environment and development must be pursued as mutually reinforcing concerns. In fact, when the environment is harmed, it is most often the poor who are first and hardest hit. And at the same time, development tends to harm the environment at the expense of the poor, often for the benefit of only a privileged few. So the theory then proceeds from the scientific reality that economic and social systems cannot function if earth systems are not properly functioning, and that this lack of functioning will have dire consequences for the pursuit of social justice. The theory challenges thinking about rights in concealed compartments and promotes socio-ecological a socio-ecological perspective about the enforcement of rights. It's a, a systems thinking approach that recognizes the idea that humans and their environments are strongly coupled to the point that they exist in a single socio-ecological system. This perspective aligns closely with the logic of Ubuntu that our functioning and flourishing is linked to our relationships with each other and with the broader earth community, past, present, and future. The theory illustrates the transformative potential of substantive rights and, and or rather substantive rights-based adjudication by the judiciary when considering disputes about the functioning of socio-ecological systems in South Africa, particularly when those disputes have social, environmental and climate justice implications for South Africa's poor, vulnerable and marginalized. So the theory promotes a shift in legal culture from formalism to substantive engagement with rights, recognizing their intersecting nature. And of course, the links between human flourishing and a well-functioning environment have, have come up already several times in the session. Um, and, uh, and also how these ideas link to the enforcement of economic, social, and cultural rights. And, and this is becoming more and more obvious amidst the current global climate crisis, as we see an increase in climate-related disasters with grave consequences for the most vulnerable in our society. And to bring it home, I have a, a one-minute video that I'll share with you that kind of illustrates the point quite nicely. Well, I actually uh, don't even have a place uh, to go, so I I think I'm gonna have to stay a while with uh, some friends. So what this video vividly illustrates is that this community's rights to life, dignity, access to housing, food, water, and sanitation, and a right to environment, an environment not harmful to health and well-being, have all been severely impacted as a result of flooding. Although attribution science can't pinpoint particular flooding instances to climate change, we are seeing a growing number of climate related disasters that have the greatest impact on people who are already in environment, environments that, are, that cause their vulnerability and who are already experiencing great social injustice. And um, 
So the video then shows us how the distribution of social, environmental and climate burdens are unevenly experienced by the vulnerable and the marginalized, who are also least able to adapt. When the government doesn't want to respond, as we see in that video, courts need to step in. Separately, an illustration of how environmental degradation impacts and relates to cultural and other rights vividly emerges from reduced marine life in the Eastern Cape Coast, which has resulted in fishing communities being prevented from exercising long-standing customary fishing practices, impacting their food security, livelihoods, and cultural practices. The chilling prospect of shells exploration in the wild coast is likely to exacerbate the deprivation experienced by these communities. Again, illustrating social, environmental and climate injustice that affects a range of rights. In response to climate vulnerabilities, there is then a growing body of climate change litigation around the world, including in South Africa, aimed at responding to key climate change adaptation and mitigation challenges to ensure the fulfillment of a range of rights. Some of this litigation explicitly grapples with the interrelated nature of environmental rights and other socioeconomic and cultural rights, recognizing that we live in environments that need to be protected to fulfill all other rights. But much of it does not, including in South Africa. And although transformative, and so that's the challenge that transformative environmental constitutionalism poses, is how can we recognize these rights as intersecting and why is this important? And I hope I've, I've showed you that a little bit. Now, although the theory is designed with the South African context in mind, the value for those engaging at rights at the regional or international level is how it demonstrates the intersecting nature of rights that rights are interrelated and mutually reinforcing with one another, particularly the environmental rights. And a range of justiciable human rights enshrined in domestic, regional and international instruments could be invoked in conjunction with the environmental right to facilitate substantive rights-based approaches to the adjudication of disputes about the functioning of socio-ecological systems in pursuit of social, environmental, and climate justice. The relevant rights include the rights of the child, the rights to life and dignity, rights to access to housing, food, water, and uh, customary law rights. The environmental right, like these other rights, not only serves to guarantee survival interests, but is also concerned with enabling people to live decent lives. And an example of the, this intersecting nature of rights was revealed in October 2021, so earlier this year, when the UN C Committee on the Rights of the Child in Saatchi grappled with how states are recklessly causing life-threatening climate change that is infringing children's rights to life, health, and culture. And although that claim were, was largely unsuccessful for, for procedural reasons, um, what's promising is the recognition of intersecting rights uh, and the links between climate change and other rights um, as a necessity for, for responding to climate change as a necessity for fulfilling other rights. And a legal theory of transformative environmental constitutionalism facilitates engagement with these claims given its uh, core premises that we exist in socio-ecological systems the flourishing of which is a precondition for the fulfillment of all other rights. And modern conditions of life implicating survival in interests and the ability to, of people to live decent lives are really vividly um, illustrated by the global climate crisis, as I hope I've shown you, and the imagery of a socio-ecological system that's in a state of collapse. And this imagery, I argue, justifies reliance on the environmental rights alongside other rights, particularly for poor, vulnerable, and marginalized people who wish to respond to social, environmental, and climate justice injustices as interconnected concerns. Thank you very much, Dr. Mercart. Uh, for that excellent presentation. I think that you can see how these things have been brought together. I just want to note, if you've been looking at the program, I've cut the panel time short by 15 minutes. 
because I believe in the audience here and our ability to engage the speakers uh, very productively for an extra 15 minutes and to engage each other on the topic of legal culture and transformative constitutionalism and how it needs to contribute to the enforcement and realization of economic and social rights in Africa and elsewhere. So let me open it to the floor to anybody who has questions that they want to ask. And I'll pause for about 30 seconds to see if there's any hands that go up. I see one. And then I'll move on afterwards to questions that I have. But I see, to begin with, Nicholas Arago, um, there's a question. I'm acknowledging you. You can uh, come to the floor. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, my question is directed to uh, Professor Villion, uh, who has given quite a, a wonderful summary in relation to legal culture. And um, looking at uh, the possibilities that we have uh, with the litigation at uh, the regional level, especially in the African Court on Human and People's Rights, um, how much of a factor is uh, the lack of um, declarations um, having been made by countries to allow uh, non-governmental organizations and individuals to have direct access uh, to the court? Um, how much is this um, uh, as a result of the conservative legal culture of uh, the different countries and how much of it is a challenge towards active um, involvement and adjudication of economic and social rights by the court. Um, and uh, also in, in, in that context, um, how much of a legal culture do we have um, a culture of impunity that makes it impossible, impossible or difficult uh, for countries to then implement decisions that have been issued by the African court? Um, a case in point is um, the case of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights versus Kenya, uh, where uh, even though the court made uh, quite uh, substantive declarations um, and uh, gave directions to the Kenyan government, it has refused to uh, to implement that particular decision. Okay, Professor Fuyun. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arago, for the for the question. Um, I think in terms of, that is a very interesting question, and I have to think that we should all explore it a little further. The link between Article 34.6 and specifically the lack of socioeconomic rights cases, because if we work on the premise that, right, I mean, there are 31 state parties to the court protocol, all of those can bring a case first to the commission, and then all the um, defects and the impediments of the commission are then visited upon this case, and that will uh, cause the case perhaps not to come to the court. However, for those states that have made the 34-6 declaration, the individual can, after exhausting local remedies, or if there is no local remedy available, can go directly go to the African court. So let us look at those uh, states. Uh, that 10 states, we know that Rwanda withdrew and Tanzania withdrew and Benin withdrew, uh, Cote d'Ivoire withdrew their declaration. So if we look at the remaining states, it would be very interesting to see to what extent is uh, you know, their socioeconomic rights being justiciable inside those states. In other words, is there a, a legal culture that actually allows for those issues to be raised at the domestic level? And why should we then ask, have none of these potential cases actually come to the African court via the route of Article 34.6. So I'm looking at Malawi. So as Professor Chiwa said, Malawi actually has a very uh, good, a solid framework for socioeconomic rights. Uh, some of them uh, directly provided for and some um, uh, indirectly. We look at Ghana, again, the same. There are certain socioeconomic rights that are provided for and they are direct principles of state policy. And in the Francophone countries that remain and the new ones who have joined, we have Niger and we have um, also Cap Verde, uh, which I think very promising and interesting cases because there's the kind of idea of monism that actually, you know, a litigant can invoke those socioeconomic rights which are in the covenant or in the African Charter directly and then uh, the case can come. So I would imagine that, uh, you know, I'm exploring this with you. I think that the most feasible way of the court getting socioeconomic rights cases to adjudicate would be through Article 34.6. Clearly, why have not more states made 34.6 declarations? I don't think that thoughts about socioeconomic rights are 
prominent or pertinent in their decision. It's more about general issues around state sovereignty and the idea of not having their, you know, constitutional court or apex court being uh, somehow second guessed. If I go by South Africa's reluctance to 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 make the 346 declaration, but I think we must focus on those countries that have the 346 declaration in place, maybe explore what kind of civil society organizations, NGOs there are that potentially could litigate, do strategic litigation on socioeconomic rights issues, ensure that domestic remedies are exhausted. And perhaps for us who are interested as academics, broader civil society in Africa, we can forge collaborations, work with um, specifically, um, you know, with CSOs, NGOs, lawyers, in those countries where it is actually quite possible to exhaust those socioeconomic rights remedies and then take those cases to the court. Because the court, the case is not going to come by themselves. Even if the state made the 346 declaration, quite obviously it needs to be initiated and the, the initiation has to come at the domestic level in the first instance. Yes, you raised the issue of implementation or non-implementation of not only the commission's findings, which are you know, technically from an international point of view, non-binding, but also the court's decisions, um, you know, the the theory was that at least, uh, you know, because the court's decisions are um, from an international law point of view binding, that states would be more likely to actually comply with these decisions. Uh, you mentioned the case of Ken Kenya that has, has not. I think, though, that uh, comparing the state reaction to the commission's decisions or findings and the court findings, that there is... Um, prospects for greater um, likelihood of compliance. We've at least seen Burkina Faso comply like fully in a number of cases, in two cases. We've seen other states at least comply to a certain extent. And I think states are at least reluctant to frontally contest the binding nature of the court's decisions, but usually would, I mean, Kenya in this case of the OGEC as well, would talk about the panel domestic processes that are put in place. So it's not a, it's not a, a, a kind of an outright denial of um, accountability or at least uh, the obligation to implement. But yeah, you are right. The mere fact that we now have court judgments doesn't automatically translate to better compliance at the domestic level. Which is also a problem that we experience even in a country where we have many, many court judgments on economic and social rights in South Africa and a court that is backtracking somewhat on the enforcement powers that it may have in terms of a broad, very broad power in the South African constitution in South Africa. So again, it speaks to legal culture that, that exists on many different levels. So, but now before I ask my questions, I see we do have another hand. So Mariel Reis, I, I hope I'm saying your name properly. Thank you so much. Yes, it's me again. Um, and I'm following these discussions with um, great, great pleasure. Thank you so much for providing this forum and um, for these amazing speakers. Um, I, I'm wondering um, about um, to what extent, and maybe all of the speakers can, can address this um, with regards to their specific um, knowledge. Um, to what extent does the um, the construction and the setup of these re of the regional economic communities, the regional organizations on the continent, um, and their institutional design, so the way the judicial um, organs are set up, the way that, um, for example, the East African Court of Justice is set up as um, constructed or was constructed in the 90s, um, plays into the way um, we see jurisdiction um, now. And um, and if you have any insights with regards to the power dynamics um, that lead to the specific institutional configuration of, um, of, of these regional organizations. And then within that, the, um, the, the jurisdiction or the judicial body. Um, and if I may, I have, um, if, with regards to the EAC specifically, interestingly enough, um, there was this idea to actually implement a human rights jurisdic jurisdiction of the court um, that was manifested in the treaty, um, but that never actually was operationalized um, due to the opposition of um, certain heads of state. Um, and just these kinds of power dynamics, I'm wondering to what extent you look at this with regards to your research and, and what your take is on this. Um, sorry, very long question. Looking forward to your answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think that that question can remain for everyone to answer. I'm going to ask two specific questions, one for Michael and one for Dr. Murkart. 
And we'll start with Michael and then go on to Dr. Murkart and then allow Professor Fulyun another opportunity to respond to Mariel's question. Um, so you can take the questions together. For Michael, um, in addition to the, the ECOWAS situation, which we've just spoken about, um, uh, on the so Southern African level, it appears to be, to me at least, that the states um, have taken the idea of coordination at a very minimalist uh, approach. As you say, they see it as a trade um, environment, but not really even that, because uh, the SADC has been reluctant even to coordinate in vaccine acquisition, for example, in the context of COVID-19, despite the fact that there's human rights obligations to do that. And even if there weren't, from a simple perspective of many of the countries, you know, getting COVID vaccines would, would make sense. Um, the the, the over underlying issue seems to be that states feel as a hang up from colonialism that interfering in another state's business or uh, trying to coordinate too much, which involves interfering and changing another state's mind is not an appropriate thing for any state to do. I wonder if you have comments on uh, on, on this, um, the, the this culture of seeing interference of any kind in another state's business, even in coordination, to be one that's colonial somehow. And then to Dr. Murkot, uh, it's a similar question, actually. Um, you'll have seen that in South Africa, the Minister of Mineral Resources, Gwede Mantashe, um, has said very recently, quite shockingly, we consider the objections to these developments, the developments that you spoke about in the Wild Coast in relation to Shell, as apartheid and colonialism of a special type masqueraded as the greatest interest for environmental protection. So here we have a minister of a government very clearly saying that those people who are campaigning for the protection of the environment are trying to reinforce colonialism and apartheid. Um, so my question would be, how do we respond to these within the framework of transformative environmental constitutionalism? So there's a question for Michael and a question for Dr. Murkot, and uh, we'll go in that order and then back to Professor Fuyun to answer Mariel's questions too. Thank you very much, Tim. And I think it, it, it goes back perhaps to this this idea of being hung up on a, a very per pervasive culture of colonialism that made it, you know, people, even when you come, we go all the way back to the African Union and why the OAU became a very loose intergovernmental union rather than a more connected supranational body was as a result of this whole kind of wrangling that some states wanted a much loose union while Kwame Nkrumah who was the, the primary proponent of the idea of an African you know, continental union wanted a more interconnected and more supranational uh, body. But I think for me, it's, it really is a lost, lost opportunity when a regional economic community, which has the basic uh, mandate of promoting economic integration is even you know, incapable of cooperating in things that affect the economies quite tremendously. Because when it comes to things like you know, purchasing vaccines, perhaps collective you know, efforts among states would have been more useful in increasing bargaining power with the vaccine manufacturers. And also you know, ensuring that if states could act jointly as a block, they could have more power in negotiating with the kind of impositions that we see in these days of you know, the specific states um, banning specific countries because some variants have been found within their jurisdiction. So it, it really is, it's, it's a huge um, opportunity that, that, that has been lost, but perhaps it also goes back to the same issues that you speak about that, you know, African leaders are quite protective of their own space. And this idea that if you allow the, the bloc to make more decisions on your behalf, then you would have lost that sovereignty over the ability to take a specific domestic decisions. But really in the end, it doesn't really help anybody because Nobody benefits from a you know disjointed uh, decision-making process where each specific state within a region is negotiating you know with manufacturers and and uh, and uh, intermediaries, even though they know that they don't have the capacity to negotiate for for you know big reductions in in in, in business, or the ability to actually uh, politically influence how decisions are, are made around travel bans, for instance, or, or other kinds of issues. But when it comes to the ESU, for instance, I would think that it's perhaps the same idea of a legal culture that is scared of accountability, because it, as part, the, the ESU treaty was quite clear that at some point there would be an adoption of that would provide the East African Court of Justice a specific human rights mandate. And 
there has been quite a bit of resistance from some states within the, the EAC because, of course, of the same reason that African governments are scared of accountability. They, they would, you know, if, if they would talk about all these nice things about human rights, but when it comes to, you know, uh, institutions that actually become functioning, well functioning, and are able to perform their mandate, then the problem starts. We've seen the same thing happening to the African court, that when the African court actually started doing its work in a manner that most people who are human rights advocates or who work in the sector expect it to work, then we started seeing withdrawals that started from Rwanda, then Tanzania, and then Benin, and then Cote d'Ivoire, that, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk but there's very little commitment to the idea of accountability itself. And perhaps that's something that we need to work on more and more because accountability, I mean, human rights without accountability probably would, would have very less value for anybody. Yeah, those would be my, my, my remarks on those questions. Thanks, Michael. Dr. Merkatz. Thanks. So I think the minister's comments are, are flawed for a number of reasons. And, and the first is, is that it, the minister ignores the prospect of a climate apartheid that um, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights um, has warned us about emerging from the uneven distribution of climate change impacts and the, and, and of course the, inability to adapt, which is the result of a, a legacy of colonialism. And, and so that reality is ignored in the, in the comments that the minister makes. The other reality that the minister ignores is the, that Shell is a, a Dutch company that will extract and destroy and externalize the cost of its development and um, harm a range of human rights and that Shell's extractive behavior is an example of neo-colonialism and that the minister is perpetuating both the climate apartheid and neo-colonialism by um, advancing this development in the face of the, the impacts. The third reality that the minister ignores, which is surprising given that he sits on the presidential climate commission is that um, we, as a country, have committed in our national policy, both the National Development Plan and our nationally determined contribution under the, the Paris Agreement to pursue a just transition towards renewable energy and to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. And so the minister's approach is in direct contravention of those commitments. And the just transition is all about securing um, clean energy and jobs that are, are based on ecological sustainability and, and so and of course equitable distribution social environmental and climate justice as as interconnected concerns so the minister is ignoring all of those things and I, I think the statements are, are rather obviously opportunistic um, and I mean there's another debate to be had about the financial interest that that the ruling party is alleged to have in, in Shell. Um, but how does transformative environmental constitutionalism respond to that? Well, one of the ways is that a transformative environmental constitutionalism looks at unpacking the content of South Africa's environmental right, which of course the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy has a duty to promote, protect and fulfill. And what that right says is that um, the environment must be protected through measures which secure ecologically sustainable development whilst promoting only justifiable social and economic development. And there's been very little said about what the promotion of justifiable economic development means in the context of securing ecologically sustainable development, but that's where legal culture needs to adapt and respond in a time of the climate crisis and say, well, a development that will see um, massive amounts of degradation and will harm poor and vulnerable people most is likely going to require a lot stronger justification um, to be justifiable um, than the minister has given. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Mercot. Uh, you've answered it much more thoroughly than I possibly could have. What I think I wanted to raise by asking this question is, and these two questions is that whether or not we agree with the approach which we call decolonizing human rights or not, colonialism is thick in the environment of discussions about human rights, human rights activism, and the legal culture that surrounds it in Africa. And so we, we need to be able to respond to these things um, because of the fact that they are going to be prevalent wherever we see things like this. It's not a coincidence that some of the African Commission cases that were raised earlier also involve Shell, the exact same company destroying the environment as far north as Nigeria. Um, so now to move on to Professor Phil Yuen for this next answer. Thank you very much, Tim. Yes, just maybe to link to what uh, Dr. Mercot said, and also to uh, maybe link it to the broader political culture. I think it's the interrelatedness of all rights, uh, the so-called civil political rights to a freedom of association, freedom of expression, right? So I think that we find that in the context that those kind of demonization of human rights defenders take place exactly in the name of uh, discursive framework such as uh, colonial impositions in order to stifle those very interrelated um, important rights such as um, you know expression and um, association and I, I, we've, we've seen very very unfortunate um, incidents as we know around uh, the human rights defenders within the context of of assertion of uh, environmental um, rights but as to the question on um, the regional economic communities i think i stick with the political context there and uh, say that uh, these uh, regional economic communities are also i think products of their their political um, you know cultures surrounding them and, and and they fluctuate and evolve over time if we think of the ECOWAS uh, community um, initially there was no court there was no individual access to the court and there were there were no human rights mandate to the court. And these evolved over time. I think it was a Nigerian trader that brought a case to the court that was then instituted. There was no individual access. That developed, that was a change to the treaty regime that the states accepted, perhaps because of the hegemonic position of Nigeria, but also that it reinforced the idea of regional um, integration, which for the weaker West African states perhaps makes much more sense. Compare that perhaps to Southern Africa with SADC, where we saw the demise of the SADC tribunal um, because of individual access being used to assert human rights. And I think the political context clearly is very different. It was a context where the, the pertinent issue before the tribunal was that of land rights and land rights linked back to the context of colonialism. And you have states in Southern Africa with a much more recent experience of decolonized being decolonized and, and you know becoming independent and all of those kind of political factors related to that context i think informed the the very unfortunate and, and quite um uh, you know far-reaching reaction to the salic tribunal's decision in the campbell case and i and i don't foresee that really being reversed because i think even at the time when echo was had that idea of allowing individuals access to that court the african court did not exist Today, there is an African court that exists, and some countries are quite reluctant to accept the jurisdiction of the court, and I'm sure they're going to use the existence of the African court as a reason not to restore also the individual access to the to the SADC tribunal. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we have now uh, six minutes left, and I'm going to give two minutes to each of our speakers to close, but I'm going to ask you, while you close, to consider something which I'm deliberately springing on you. Um, uh, because I'm a bit of a trouble causer, we have deliberately smushed together these workshops and we will get to poverty and uh, to sexual orientation and identity, gender identity tomorrow. But I'd like to ask you from the perspective of people who are coming with, with expertise within the field of economic and social rights, expertise in other fields, what in the world does this conversation have to do with queer people, LGBT people? Um, and I understand that, that, that we haven't asked you to prepare for this, but I'd like to get a perspective from our experts today so we can ask the opposite of people tomorrow about economic and social rights. Um, and then you can say whatever else you want in closing. You've got two minutes each. Um, I can start in, in the only order we haven't had, which is Dr. Murkot, then Professor Vuyun, and then Michael to finish. And Michael is also doing the closing remarks for the day. Well, I think um, what I would say, first of all, that the conversation has to do with 
queer people and um, issues of gender is that um, environmental impacts harm the most vulnerable the most. And queer people do fall into that category of, of vulnerable and marginalized people. So that, that is one way in which the conversations intersect. Another way in which for me, um, the conversations intersect is that all forms of injustice are interrelated. And so gender injustice is interrelated to social, environmental, climate injustice and so on. And so if we are in a struggle using rights to respond to injustice, then gender injustice is, is one of the struggles that we must advance um, alongside all the other struggles for justice. Uh, so I, I haven't had a lot of time to think about it, but I hope that that gives some kind of answer. Don't worry, that was by design. Professor Fuyun? I'm sure the, the answers that Dr. Murcott gave, um, I would associate myself with. I think those make a lot of sense. I think clearly um, persons are, who are sexual and gender minorities are often at the at the outskirts of society and they, on a kind of empirically, it would be shown that in particular trans persons, so trans persons in our societies are some of the most economically marginalized uh, in, uh, in our communities. And uh, in so far as this debate about socioeconomic rights uh, impacts on everyone, it impacts in a very particular way on those communities that suffer disproportionately from these, these impacts. But I think the second reason for me that there is an intersection is, um, I, I link back to what Professor Odin Kalu said. So much of the application of laws and, uh, uh, you know, uh, arrests being made and, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the enforcement of, 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 of whatever is in place in various countries would rely on discretion. Discretionary actions often linked to, you know, uh, the prospect of, uh, of uh, some, of some form of financial benefit to those officials that, that, that exercise the discretion. So the, the fact that you look in a particular way that you are often at a different level of the social stratum, that makes you more vulnerable. So I think it's the intersection of class, race, and orientation and uh, identity that really is, is crucial to the understanding of the lived experience of, of lesbian, gay, and trans persons in the African continent. So it makes it very pertinent that we actually bind together socioeconomic and cultural rights and, and uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Thanks. Yes, um, I, I suppose it's, it's my turn now. now. For me, I think the, the connections are very, very quite obvious. Um, when you think of the fact that perhaps discrimination against persons based on their sexual orientation and gender identity would in essence deprive them of access to education or housing or healthcare, which perpetuates the same cycle of, of, of inequality. Because if a person cannot get access to education, then they, they become left behind in the socioeconomic structure of, of, of the society. And if they cannot uh, get access to healthcare or housing, they they, they suffer the, the same kinds of, of consequences. So it's it it's for me it it really is it's quite strange why we have not made a lot more connections between how the persons you know positioning within society and how they are perceived based on either their real or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity could influence the kind of access that they have to you know socioeconomic amenities and we we. In the places where you know people cannot go to clinics or hospitals to get medication or they, themselves checked because they are scared that they might be victimized for their yeah, sexual orientation because the doctor is going to ask you how did you uh, come into this injury or how how did you you know get infected with this particular and and you'd have to explain that is of you know, you have to explain your sexuality as a means of having access to that kind of you know service and yeah for me it's it's it really is quite clear and, and, and straightforward and perhaps we need to make more and more interconnections between how you know, perceived or real gender identity and sexual orientation actually impacts on people's ability to have access to the most basics of uh, economic, uh, social, and, and cultural rights. And the more we do that, the better for, for everyone. Right? Okay, thank you, Michael. I think that the thing is here that uh, there is a disproportionate impact on all marginalized groups of all human rights violations. But one of the things which I always come back to when people ask questions like this about intersectionality is even if there wasn't 
a disproportionate impact. Of course, people who are LGBT people, persons are just people too. And if they're in the African continent, they are also affected by everything that happens in the African continent. Um, and it's somewhat surprising to me that we don't talk about the range of issues. And actually you see the prioritization even in the strategic litigation that happens around LGBTI persons in Africa and around the world of civil and political rights in the same way as you see the prioritization in general. Um, so this is maybe not so surprising at all, although I asked the question as if it might be. Um, now, Michael, I don't know if you want to say something else. Uh, you are on the program for closing remarks. If you don't, I think you've, you've summed up very well. If you are done, then I think that we're going to hand back to the facilitators to give us guidance about tomorrow. Uh, Michael, is there anything? Well, no specific closing remarks per se, except to say that um, we're, we're very grateful for everybody's participation today, to both panelists, for the participants who stayed behind um, throughout the day and, and uh, listened to you know, different panels and keynotes being delivered today. And we hope that they will be able to join us again tomorrow as we explore more of these issues. And tomorrow we do have a specific intersectional panel to talk you know, a bit more about the intersection between poverty and so-called transgressive, uh, transgressive uh, sexualities. And um, we're looking forward to seeing everybody uh, tomorrow. There was a hand, a hand up uh, quickly that went off again. I'm not sure if they, it, it was- I think, I think it was people clapping because it's rapturous applause for your remarks. Oh, very well. Well, otherwise, thank you everyone. And we hope that uh, we will see you again tomorrow and uh, you can invite your friends and colleagues and any other person who you think might also find this quite interesting and uh, hopefully we can engage for that uh, tomorrow. But thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you everyone. Tiruna, would you like to tell us uh, where to go tomorrow and what we're doing and all of that? Is that okay? And then we're... Okay. Um, thank you everyone for logging in for the full day's event and for following the sessions. Um, ahead of tomorrow, I'd just like to share some information. So we will again be having um, a SOGI session and an ESCR session. However, tomorrow they'll be running simultaneously. So if you've registered for day two, there is a registration link um, for the second day that you can use. When you log in, you will either stay in the main room for the ESCR session or you can use the breakout room, which has been set up for the SOGI session. So you can choose according to your interests which session you would like to attend for the morning session, which um, starts at 11 a.m. South African Standard Time tomorrow. And in the afternoon, we will be having the intersectional panel that I think we've kind of alluded to a little this afternoon um, and given you a taste of what the conversation will largely be about. So um, you do have that option tomorrow. Um, of, the, of the sessions, only one will be live stream, which is the intersectional panel, but we will do our best to record both the ESCR session and the SOGI session. Um, if Zoom permits. Um, but yeah, thank you so much um, for your attention and your time today. And we will see you bright and early tomorrow at 11. And um, I hope you're all prepared with more questions and comments um, to touch on the intersections between ESCR and SOGI rights in Africa. So I will just end the session now and I will leave the room open for 60 seconds if there's any questions or comments that quickly need to be typed out. Otherwise we are done for the day. Thank you.